Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out this morning. My name is Jane. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Connecticut DEP Wildlife Division. I'm also the steward of the Belding Wildlife Management Area. This is part of it here. And I'm going to talk today about how we can improve habitat for wildlife. So you might be wondering, well, why do we need to improve if we, if we let it go, isn't that good enough? And I've even heard people say, I think wildlife has come back. I see a lot of white-tailed deer. And yes, white-tailed deer are very abundant. Why do you think white-tailed deer are so abundant now? What's that? No predators. Ah, so they are their natural predators have been wiped out. Um, their biggest predator now is vehicles. Well, what type of habitats do deer use? Forest. forest, different stages of forest, different types of forest, shrublands, swamps. What do deer eat? Vegetation. vegetation. What kind of vegetation? Loads, all kinds of vegetation. So deer prefer a few things. They eat everything. They eat just about everything in the forest. They even come into your yards and eat your tasty ornamental shrubs. They have a lot of food. There's a lot for them out there. They do very well in small woodlots, which we now have a lot of in Connecticut. So deer have been doing very well. Most of our species are not doing so well. Things like this. Who recognizes this critter? What, what is it? Here we are, I'll recognize it as a caterpillar. Okay, this is the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. So this caterpillar will turn into the monarch butterfly. What do monarch caterpillars eat? Milkweed. Milkweed. What else do monarch caterpillars eat? It's a trick question. Nothing else, they eat nothing but milkweed. What would happen if we didn't have any milkweed? we would have no monarch butterflies. And in fact, the monarch butterfly population has been declining precipitously in the past couple of decades. One of the big reasons, there are a few factors that um, impact populations, but one of the big reasons now is a loss of milkweed across the landscape. The monarch butterfly population has declined so bad that the International um, Union of the Conservation of Nature has listed the monarch butterfly as an endangered species. It's not a legally protected species, but um, in one listing, the IUCN's red list, they've listed it as endangered because their population has gotten so low so quickly. So as we said, one of the big problems for monarch butterflies now is the lack of milkweed. So we can help monarchs by growing a lot of milkweed, but milkweed does not grow in the forest. Milkweed grows in open habitats like grasslands, meadows, what we refer to as early successional habitats or early stage habitats, those habitats that occur early on in the process of forest succession, which I'll get to in a minute. But it's not just monarch butterflies that are in trouble. Butterflies as a whole are in trouble. So if you look at the whole group of butterflies, the populations have been steadily decreasing. And if you look at insects as a whole, their populations have been declining even more. And this is a serious concern because we need insects. This has made headlines. Some have re been, been referring to it as the insect apocalypse. Insects can be declining based on different estimates as much as 85% in the past few decades. This is a serious concern because we need insects. As National Geographic tells us, you'll miss them when they're gone. They do so many things for us, things that we don't even think about. But it's not just insects, birds are declining as well. And this was in the news also in the past 50 years in the United States and Canada, we've lost 3 billion birds. So that's about a third of all the birds that were in the United States and Canada are no longer there. And populations are declining for many of these species. So what is it that's causing these declines? What is it that these species need that they're not getting. So let's think first, well, what do these species need? What do all animals need in order to survive? Animals have to find four different things within their habitat in order to survive and to reproduce. It's important for them to reproduce. All animals have to be able to complete their life cycle in order for that species to exist. So what are the four things that all animals need to find in their habitat? The four things they need to survive and to reproduce. 
That's one thing. Yes. Yep, they have to have their type of habitat. And what are they finding in their habitat? Space, Space is a good one. Yeah. What else? Food, water, shelter, and space. All animals have to find enough space in order to find all of the food and water and shelter that they need to survive and to reproduce. If you look at a photograph of the earth at night, this photo sort of drives home how much space we have taken up. And as Doug Tallamy, who wrote Bringing Nature Home, tells us, so far we have not shared space very well with our fellow earthlings. So each species has to have enough space, but it's not just an area of land. As we said, each species needs its own type of habitat. So each species has to have a suitable amount of space and the type of space for each species matters. So we have to have suitable places for all critters to exist. We have to have space. So as I mentioned before, with the milkweed that grows in grasslands, meadows, old fields, early successional habits, habitats, early stage habitats. This is an old field habitat. Uh, this is along that line, that process of succession. So let's take a look at succession. What is succession? Succession is a natural process where one group of plants is replaced by another group of plants over time. Now, each stage in this process of succession is important. So each stage is important for different species of wildlife. So if you go back to the very early stage of succession, bare ground, which might happen after a flood or a fire or a glacier retreating, well, that bare ground is where the killdeer lays her eggs. Her eggs blend in with the bare ground. So we have a few birds like that, tiger beetles, some of our um, ground nesting bees, our native solitary nesting bees, they need that exposed ground. Some of our plants need that exposed ground, but it's not going to stay that way forever. Eventually grasses, wildflowers will start to sprout, turning into a grassland that's great habitat for bobolink. This is one of our grassland ground nesting birds. We have a lot of birds that nest on the ground, many in grasslands, but also in shrublands and old fields in forests, young forests, old forests. But as the grassland continues through this process of succession, scattered shrubs and tree seedlings will start to pop up here and there. Now it's old field habitat and that's great habitat for a blueing warbler. As those shrubs and tree seedlings continue to fill in, making a nice dense shrubland habitat, well, now it's good for species like the brown thrasher. The brown thrasher is a species of special concern in Connecticut. Its population has been declining because of the loss of shrubland habitat. So as those tree seedlings continue to grow into a young forest, that's good habitat for rough grouse. The rough grouse population has declined really bad lately. In fact, there's so few left in Eastern Connecticut now. So one of the reasons, lack of young forest that young forest is going to grow up into older forest. And that's where you'll find species like scarlet tanager and a lot of the forest birds that we're familiar with. In fact, most of the undeveloped land in Connecticut now is mature deciduous forest. These are the stages early in that process of succession. So these are the ones that we refer to as early successional habitat, or you could refer to it as young forest. The forest hasn't grown up yet. And what is an old forest before it was an old forest? It was a young forest, yes. So if you look at Connecticut's list of threatened, endangered, and special concern species, you'll see that many of those species on the list are ones that dep depend on these early stage habitats. And that's because we're losing these habitats. So if we wanna have all of our critters, we have to have suitable places for all of them to exist. We have to have all of these habitat stages. And some of our species depend on multiple stages of habitat. The American woodcock, and I'll see if I can play this sound. No, it doesn't wanna play. If you go out in the evening at this time of year to an area where you have some open field habitat next to some young deciduous forest, you might hear these woodcock displaying. They start displaying just as it starts to get dark. So go out and listen this evening. You might hear them calling. But they need both of those stages of habitat. Um, display habitat, 
nesting habitat. Even forest interior birds depend on forest openings where they do a lot of their feeding. They're find a lot, finding a lot of insects in those forest openings. Now, how much of these habitats do we need? How much space for each of these habitats? We know that then when, when the settlers first arrived in Connecticut, they did encounter vast tracts of forest. And what did they do to that forest? Yeah, they cut it down. How's this for forest wildlife? Not good, pretty bad. How's this for grassland wildlife? It was pretty good. So at this point, forest wildlife decreased, grassland wildlife increased because back at this time, agriculture moved at a much slower pace. So those grassland ground nesting birds like that bobolink, meadowlark, grasshopper sparrows, upland sandpipers, they would be able to raise their young before the scythe came along, before the sheep trampled the nest. So this was good habitat for our grassland species. But when people abandoned their farms for the cities or for the richer soils of the Midwest, what happened? Started to grow, succession happened. So it went through that continuum, slowly losing its grassland habitat, gaining old field habitat, then shrubland habitat. So as the grasslands get smaller, you, you're losing grassland species but you're gaining old field species. And as those shrubs and tree seedlings fill in, now you're starting to gain shrubland species. And then as the forests start to grow up, you're gaining young forest species and losing those other species. And then eventually the forest grew back into this mature forest. And you might've learned about stone walls from the forestry workshop. If you went to the forestry workshop or read some of the forestry information on the website. If you're walking through the forest and you see these stone walls, Think about the different stages of habitat that that forest went to before it came back to here. So how is it that our forests were able to grow back? We know that if you cut down the Amazon rainforest, it doesn't grow back. So think about that. But the forest did grow back. So if the forest is just trying to grow back, why do we need to be concerned about those early successional habitats and those species that live in early successional habitats? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. You need them to keep um, coming up again and again and again. You can't just have only forest or only grassland. Can't have only forest, or, right? You need to have suitable places for all critters to exist. You need those different stages. And as it turns out, we always had those different stages of habitat. So even though there was a lot of forest and the forest is trying to grow back, we also had those other stages of habitat. In fact, it's estimated that we have less grassland in Connecticut now than we did before the settlers arrived. So how was it that we kept having those early stage habitats? How was it that it kept going back to an earlier stage and then growing. Yes. Ah, wildfires. And wildfires or fires were a frequent occurrence on the landscape. And fires are why we have fire dependent species like pitch pine. Pitch pine is a native plant and it depends on fire. It evolved with fire. So fires will open up the cones and it also burns off the leaf litter because those seeds need exposed soil in order to germinate. So now we have mature pitch pines, but we don't have the young pitch pines. What happens to a population if there is no recruitment, if there is no young ones? Eventually it will die out. As the old ones die and there's no new ones to replace them, you won't have that species anymore. So pitch pine is one of our fire dependent or what we refer to as disturbance dependent species, specifically fire for the pitch pines. But what happens now when it when a fire breaks out? We want to put it out. Or we don't put it out. We put it out, right? So this does not bode well for pitch pine and other disturbance dependent species. Now, as I mentioned, fire was a frequent occurrence. Pitch pines evolved with fire. That's why our forests grew back. Our forests are adapted to coming back after a disturbance like fire, but it wasn't just fire that was shaping the landscape. What other force was at work on the landscape that was helping to shape, helping to create some of these early stage habitats? Yes. Storms, yes. Hurricanes, tornadoes, 
ice storms. What else? What else was at work? The seasons. Oh, well, so the seasons can bring different storm events. Something else was at work. But how long are we talking? How long ago are we talking? Oh, it happens today. Oh, okay. Just not as much. Oh, like insect outbreaks? Mm -hmm. Yep, that can happen too, to foliate trees in an area of forest and trees are dead and new, grow, new forest grows. So we have the spongy moth caterpillars that have defoliated and killed a lot of our oaks. So that's bad for our oaks and for the species that depend on oaks, but it, it's actually good for creating early successional habitat. So yeah, insect outbreaks could be it too. Well, what about... Beavers, because what do beavers do? They cut down trees. They can cut down a lot of trees. So they were helping to shape the landscape by cutting trees, creating openings. And think back about 10,000 years ago when we still had giant beavers. So here's a comparison of today's beaver compared to the giant beaver, which is now extinct. Imagine the amount of work that giant beavers would be doing on the landscape. And it wasn't just bi giant beavers. We had mastodons. So as the glacier retreated and forests started growing back, you had giant beavers, you had mastodons, they were browsers, forests would start to grow, they'd come and munch them down. We even had in New England, woolly mammoths, and they were grazers, so they lived in the grasslands of New England. But now we know that these are extinct. But around that time, early humans had moved in. So we know that the first humans arrived at least 12,000 years ago, and they also helped to shape the landscape, cutting trees, but setting fires. So they used fire a lot. So they were part of the landscape and the landscape evolved with them. They would also plant crops. So clear an area, plant your crop, grow, a, grow it for a few years, and then abandon it. So when they abandon that, let the soil recover, that habitat is also recover while they go and plant another area. So beavers don't just cut down trees. What else do they do? They build dams. And so those dams can back up a lot of water. What happens to the trees that are still standing that are now flooded? They die. So think back to before the beavers moved in. This was forest. That's why those dead trees are standing there. They got flooded. Now they're dead. Now it's, a, it's still excellent habitat. So beaver pond or beaver swamp. This is great habitat for a lot of our wetland critters. But eventually those beavers are going to eat themselves out of house and home. They have to move on. What's going to happen to that beaver pond? Mm -hmm. Succession. Ah, succession will happen because once the beavers aren't there to maintain that dam, that dam is going to leak. That pond is going to drain. The stream will find its course and the sediment will become exposed. Now that exposed sediment is a good place to find spotted sandpipers probing in the mud looking for insects and other invertebrates but it's not going to stay exposed. Eventually grasses and sedges and wildflowers will grow. So have you ever heard the term beaver meadow? In fact, some towns in Connecticut have a beaver meadow road. Well, that's what that refers to. The pond has been abandoned. It drained, the sediment was exposed, grasses and wildflowers flowers started to grow. So now this is great habitat for bees, butterflies, beetles, other insects, birds like red-winged blackbirds, bluebirds, tree swallows but we know it's not going to stay like this. So our beaver meadow eventually is become, going to become old field, shrublands, young forest, mature forest. At this stage, the beavers can move back in and start that process all over again. So if you were looking down on the landscape at any point in time, you would have these different stages of habitat across the landscape. And so some of the critters would have to move from place to place. So as as the beaver meadow started to grow up, they might have to find a more recently abandoned pond where the flowers, wildflowers and sedges and grasses are starting to grow. You might have a one year old forest where it burned last year. You might have another area that burned 10 years ago. So now that's a 10 year old, old forest. Now we still have a lot of beavers in Connecticut, but we don't let them do the work that they're capable of because we've built our roads and our buildings too close to rivers and wetlands. So we still have the beavers, but we don't have 
all the work that they were um, able to do. I like to refer to beavers as our original wildlife habitat managers. So if we don't let fires burn and we don't let beavers do the work they're capable of, how do we create these early stage habitats? We don't let fires burn on their own. So what could we do? What about setting fire ourselves? Can you, can you recreate what, what should have been happening? We can, we can. Fire is one way, so this is a great way to maintain grassland habitat. Um, we don't burn the entire area all at once, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So burn part of the area in one year, and then maybe several years later, burn another part of the area. So this is a good way to maintain our grassland habitat. But another thing we can do is cut down the trees ourselves. So finding a suitable area of the forest, uh, a suitable space, you wanna have enough space for some of the critters that you're managing for. The important thing is once you do this cut, you, know, you can either do a clear cut or you can leave a few scattered trees, step back, step back, let it grow back and give the critters their space. The only thing that you should be doing in here now is managing any invasive plants. So at the end of the nesting season, so you're not disturbing nesting birds, you can go in there and you can manage your invasive plants. Step back, let it go through those stages. Now, you can see we left a dead tree here. Why do you think we left that dead tree there? Yes. Nesting, nesting for birds like woodpeckers. So dead standing trees, we refer to those as snags. Snags are dead standing trees and they're very important for wildlife, especially woodpeckers. Our policy is to leave all standing dead trees if safe to do so. So within our habitat areas, we try to leave all the standing dead trees. They're great for a variety of birds. All of our woodpeckers, some of the birds that you might be familiar with at your feeder, chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, they're all cavity nesters. Great crested flycatchers, some of our owls, even some of our waterfowl like mergansers and wood ducks, they nest in tree cavities. So depending where that tree is, what type of habitat it's in would determine what type of animal, usually what type of bird will be nesting in that cavity. Connecticut has 22 different species of birds that nest in tree cavities. So with this habitat, this habitat was created when they mined this land. This was private property and they mined it for sand and gravel. So they pretty much scraped everything off. That might sound like it's very destructive. Well, for the mature forest species, sure. It ended up creating a really great, unique habitat. So this is kind of like a pine barren habitat. And when it grew to this stage, there were field sparrows in there, prairie warblers, willow flycatchers, Brown thrasher, which as I said, is a species of special concern. This is great habitat for them. Tiger beetles, some of our native burrowing bees. And it stayed in private property for a while. And what happened with all these trees? Well, they, they grew up. They grew up, succession was happening. And so as they grew up and closed the canopy and the lower branches died off, there's not much cover. The ground is basically pine needles. It was a lot of white pine, but there was pitch, still pitch pine in there too. So we acquired this property and what did we do? We cut it down. Actually, we mowed down a lot of those trees. So the trees were still small enough that we were able to bring in the tree mower, mow it down. But when you mow the tree down, you're in, you end up with all this material on the ground. So as I said, we had some tiger beetles here, some native um, burrowing bees. And these are species that like that dry, sandy soil. We also had a rare plant here. This plant grows on dry, sandy soil. But if we left all of that wood there, all that chopped up wood, that would enrich the soil and make it not as good for some of those species. So we took a bulldozer to it. We rescraped it. And it filled in with native plants like native field goldenrod. Um, pearly everlasting, some native asters, that rare plant. We had some pitch pines growing in there, some native grasses, um, purple love grass. So it might sound counterintuitive that you'd bulldoze something, but it actually made great habitat. Connecticut has a lot of dry, sandy soil. 
And so a lot of our species depended on dry, sandy soil. But where do you want to build your house? Where it's dry. And so a lot of our dry, sandy soil has been built on. And that's why these species that depend on that type of habitat have become more rare. This is another one of our sites. This is a one-year-old forest. This was a commercial tree harvest. So they harvested the trees. This is what we would refer to as an irregular shelter wood cut. So most of the trees were cleared, but there were a few scattered standing trees. And of course, some standing dead trees as well. Just one year after that harvest, that area was full of birds. There were more birds there than before the harvest. And these birds are birds whose populations are declining. So the indigo bunting, the towhees, blue wing warblers were in there. Um, chestnut sided warbler was in there just one year. So we have a lot of species that like that one year old forest. Now, one of the species that depends on that young forest is the New England cottontail. Have you heard of the New England cottontail? Okay, so the New England cottontail its population had declined so much that it was considered as a candidate for listing on the Federal Endangered Species Act. Now you might see cottontail rabbits all over the place. That's the non-native cottontail rabbit. That's the Eastern cottontail. The New England cottontail has to have that thick shrubby habitat. Now, where do you think the historic range of the New England cottontail was? New England. New England. And since the New England cottontail can only survive if there's a lot of thick shrubby habitat, what does that tell you about the landscape of New England? Yeah, I used to have enough thick shrubby habitat to support healthy populations of the New England cottontail. Now, when you make habitat for the New England cottontail, of course, you're also making habitat for other things. So some of those species that I just mentioned, the brown thrasher, which is a species of special concern in Connecticut, um, the catbird. Now, the brown thrasher, as I said before, how much space do these animals need? The brown thrasher, its population has declined quite a bit because it needs a lot of shrubby habitat. Its relative, the catbird, can survive in smaller patches of shrubby habitat. But the type of shrubs matters. So you might be familiar with multiflora rose. Multiflora rose grows all over the place. It's one of our invasive plants. So we have a few invasive shrubs. Multiflora rose is one of them. We need to get rid of multiflora rose. You might have learned about Japanese barberry from the forestry station. So this is one that invades entire forest understories. This is what. <laughs> One of the things that we do a lot of in my job is controlling invasive plants, like Japanese barberry, like Asiatic bittersweet. Now, everywhere, everywhere. Now, we do have some nice native vines. The Asiatic bittersweet is the one that grows so thick and strangles trees and pulls them down. Now, you might think, well, you're pulling down trees, you're knocking it back to an early stage of habitat. It has leaves, it has berries. I've seen the birds eat the berries. Why do we need to be concerned about invasive plants? Ah, so some of them, they don't have, for example, a native caterpillar that eats the leaves, right? So, but, so it doesn't have a predator. So that might be why it's in, invasive. They outcompete natives. They outcompete natives, yes. So if you have an area that has say a hundred different plant species, native plant species, and then you have an invasive plant come in and it can wipe them all out. Now you have one species of plant, but it gets even worse than that. So you'd mentioned predators. Take a look at the leaves of the invasive plant, this non-native invasive plant, and take a look at the leaves of one of our native plants, black cherry. What's happening to these leaves? Yeah. They're being eaten, yes, they're being nibbled on. This is food. This one is not. So not only is it taking away all of the native plants, but it's taking away a lot of food because you know how the food chain works. The caterpillar feeds on the leaves. Songbird eats the caterpillar. Hawk might eat the songbird, but it's actually a little more complex. Think of it more as a food pyramid. And the base of the pyramid is made up by plants. And it's insects that are responsible more than any other group of animals for transferring energy from the plant base to higher levels of that food pyramid. And so if we lost our native plants, that would not be good 
for the rest of the food pyramid, for the rest of the food web. So as the famous biologist Edward Wilson tells us, insects are the little things that run the world. We need insects. And what is it that nearly all of our terrestrial birds feed to their young? Insects. Nearly all of our terrestrial birds raise their young on insects. Even those birds that you see at your bird feeder, they're feeding insects to their young. And caterpillars are especially important. They're very nutritious. But keep in mind, if you want bluebirds, not only do you need insects, but the bluebird is one of the cavity nesting species. So if you don't have a dead tree out in the field, you can put up a nest box. But if you put up a nest box, now you have to watch out for this guy. So this is one of our invasive animal species. So this is the invasive house sparrow. They will get in there, they outcompete the bluebirds. You need to pull that nest out and they're so persistent, you might be pulling that nest out every single day until they give up. And this is another one of our um, non-native invasive plants. And you might've learned about this one in the forestry station as well, burning bush. So burning bush invades entire understories. So look at all the food that it has taken away from the insects. So if you don't have insect food, then you won't have the insects. And if you don't have insects, you won't have the birds. So a lot of people will plant that burning bush. Unfortunately, it's not banned yet. But instead of planting burning bush, people could be planting blueberry because blueberry also has a beautiful fall color, beautiful red fall color. And over hundred different species of caterpillars feed on blueberry leaves, including this one, the spring azure butterfly. And of course they make blueberries. So nearly all of our terrestrial birds are feeding on insects, but some of our birds also supplement their diet with berries. But the kind of berry matters as well. This is gray dogwood, and the cat birds love to feed on these gray dogwood berries in the late summer. So the birds need a lot of fat to fuel up either for overwintering or for their fall migration. And Doug Tallamy's research has shown that the berries of our native plants at that time of year have a higher, much higher fat content than the berries of the non-native plants at that time of year. So even though you might see birds eating the berries of bittersweet, they're not getting the right nutrition. So it's like junk food for the birds. So it matters what type of shrubs. And just another example, this is the Norway maple. This is a very popular landscaping tree. You might think, well, it's related to our native maples, but the caterpillars don't feed on this one. Compare that to one of our native trees, the sycamore tree. So it has a variety of really interesting looking insects that feed on it, including this one here. This is the syc sycamore tussock moth caterpillar. It feeds on sycamore leaves. It doesn't feed on anything else. So just like the um, monarch caterpillar that only feeds on milkweed, the sycamore, tuss sycamore tussock moth caterpillar only feeds on sycamore. So if we didn't have sycamore, we would lose the species. So there are quite a few species out there that are very specific. So we have to have all of those plants for all the specialists. Now, this caterpillar will turn into this moth. It's not very showy, but it doesn't want to be. It's perfectly adapted to hiding out in plain sight on the bark of the sycamore tree. So just an example of how closely tied some of our animal species are with their host plant species. Now, what do we mean by native or non-native? How do we know if something is native or non-native? Do you all know what this plant is? I don't think the dandelion is native. It's not native, right. It's a European species. Is it invasive? It's not invasive. Some people might think it's invasive because it invades their lawn but it does not invade natural areas. And a lawn full of dandelions is actually much better than a lawn full of, well, lawn. So even though the dandelion is not native, it actually does have some pollinator value. So it's an early nectar source for some of our species, but it is not native. So it grows on its own, but it's not native. What about this one? Goldenrod, you might see that growing in a lot of places, just grows on its own. Is that native? What's that? Species of ah, there are about 25 different species of goldenrod that grow in Connecticut and they're all native to Connecticut. Yep, so all of our goldenrod species are native. The bees love it and so don't beetles. So we love it. It's a great pollinator plant. Now, 
As it turns out, goldenrod is a really important plant for monarch butterflies when they're migrating in the fall. So monarch butterflies, they have to find food all the way back to Mexico. And goldenrod is one of the most important plants for them to do that. So they won't get back to Mexico unless they can find food all along the way. So some people um, blame goldenrod for causing their hay fever. Goldenrod does not cause hay fever. What color is goldenrod? Yeah, it's kind of a bright yellow. How does that serve it? Why is, why is that a benefit for goldenrod to be this bright yellow color? Here's the answer, right? Oops. Here's the answer. Yeah, pollinators. It's attracting pollinators. What causes hay fever? Plants that are poll um, insect pollinated or plants that are wind pollinated? Wind. wind, wind pollinated. Goldenrod is not wind pollinated. So the insects all over it collecting that pollen. And as far as pollen goes, it's pretty heavy and sticky. It doesn't get airborne. So goldenrod does not cause your allergies, but ragweed does. So see how the flowers are very inconspicuous. They're small greenish flowers. So when you get hay fever and you look out and you see goldenrod blooming, you say, oh, that must be what's causing my allergies. When in fact, it's this inconspicuous ragweed. Now, you might not want ragweed growing around your home if you're, if you're allergic to it, if you have seasonal allergies. But ragweed turns out to be a native plant and it does have some wildlife value. There's caterpillar that's specific to ragweed and some of our birds actually feed on the seeds of ragweed. So go ahead and leave the ragweed unless you're really allergic to it. So we talked about some host specific plants, but the oak tree, really important plant, over 500 different species of caterpillars feed on oak trees. Compare that to a very popular landscaping plant, the butterfly bush. How many different caterpillars do you think can feed on butterfly bush? None, none. Now, if it just stayed put, you could provide nectar for butterflies as long as you had a lot of other native plants. But butterfly bush is already invasive in some states. So it's probably just a matter of time before it becomes invasive here as well. None of our invasive plants started off that way. So when all of our invasive plants, when they first got here, they just bided their time until the conditions were just right and then they took off. So this one, this has been here for over a hundred years, but only in the past couple of decades <clears throat> has this one become really invasive. This is called mugwort. <clears throat> Once you get to know this plant, you'll see it everywhere, especially in late summer when it has these thick flower heads. So Mugwort is our latest, nastiest invasive plant. In one of our grassland areas, it took over about 50 acres of grassland in just about two years. So this stuff is awful. Yeah, we don't like milk mugwort. So as I said, one of the things that we do a lot of in my job is controlling invasive plants. And you know, I could go into a whole um, talk about invasive plants and how to manage them. Because we, we manage mugwort differently than how we manage bittersweet. Okay, so if you're managing, say, a wildflower meadow, and now the birds are done nesting, and the leaves have fallen off, and the petals have fallen off, and so the caterpillars are done feeding, what value is this now? Well, what do you think is in those seed heads? Seeds, yes, and that's a beautiful site for birds like the goldfinch. They hang around all year. The indigo bunting migrates, but on its migration, it will fuel up on those seeds that have a lot of uh, fat content in them. And then in the wintertime, leaving those stalks standing, you have some cover for the birds. But what are they eating? I think I have this. Oh, how do I play? Like, do you know how to play a video on this? My, my, um, it, it went away. It has to be directly on the, uh, oh, there it goes. Okay. Right. So I was watching this junko outside my window. It would hop up on this stock. See it flapping its wings. It's shaking that stock. It's shaking the seeds off, hopping down and eating up the seeds. Mm -hmm. So if we mowed down those wildflower seeds before the winter and then it snowed, well, they wouldn't be able to get to them. 
But if we leave them standing, then throughout the winter, they have a food source that they can feed on. How, how am I doing on time? Yeah, that's oh, okay, great. All right, so those stalks, seeds in the fall, cover, um, food in the seeds throughout the winter, but also they're nesting sites for some of our stem nesting bees. So about 30% of our bees nest either in hollow stems like this or in cavities in wood in dead trees. So some of our bees specifically nest in those hollow stems. So they'll, they'll fill up the stem, put in a little pollen loaf in there, lay their eggs in there, and then the larvae will overwinter and emerge in the spring. We also have a few species of bees that the adult will overwinter in those dead stalks. So how many different species of native bees do you think we have in Connecticut? More than that. 300. We have about 300 different species. Yes. No, about 300 different species of native bees in Connecticut. Now, what do you think of when you think of bees? Stinging. Stinging. Most of our bees, in fact, if you've been stung, you probably weren't even stung by a bee. If you've been stung, it was most like a yellow jacket or paper wasp or possibly a white faced hornet. And if it was a bee, then probably it was a honeybee where you got too close to the hive. Most of our native bees are solitary nesters. So those bees that I meant, or those wasps, or the bees that I mentioned, the honeybees, they are communal nesters. They have a hive to defend. And that's why they're so aggressive. And that's why we know about them. We get too close to a yellow jacket hive, they're gonna come and attack us. Well, most of our native bees are solitary nesters. So either solitary nesters in those hollow stems or solitary nesters in the ground. So of our 300 species of native bees, 70% of them are ground nesting bees. And when people hear ground nesting bees, they automatically think of the yellow jackets that nest in the ground. But take a closer look. There are multiple holes. So if you see bees going in and out of all of these different holes, those are solitary nesting bees. They're docile. They don't have a hive to defend. They won't come after you. Some of them don't even have stingers. So they're, um, each one is making her own nest. It's nobody else's nest, just hers. So you might, they might be nesting close together with each one with her own nest. No hive to defend, they're not aggressive, they're not going to come after you. But in order for them to complete their life cycle, they have to have these suitable areas to defend or suitable areas to make their nests in. So they're not defending them. But if we wanna have bees, if we wanna have our native bees, they have to have nest sites as well as nectar throughout the season. And I wanna bring this one up too. So this is one of our native wasps. And again, most of our native wasps are solitary nesters. They're not going to come after you because they don't have a hive to defend. This one is pretty big. And I got really concerned when the news about murder hornets came out. So murder hornets were found just on the West Coast and they believe they eradicated them. They were nowhere near Connecticut. But I was really worried that people were going to see cicada killers and kill them because they thought they were murder hornets because they're so big. But actually one of our solitary nesting wasps, she has just her nest. She's not going to come after you. She does have a stinger. If you stepped on her with your bare foot, she would let you know she does not approve. But yes, we love cicada killer wasps. Now honeybees are not native. Honeybees are, are European species. And honeybees outcompete our native bees. And I've heard people say they want to start a honeybee hive because they're concerned about pollinators. They want to help pollinators. Well, if you want to help pollinators, if that's your goal, you don't want to set up a honeybee hive. One, they outcompete our native bees. And two, it also makes it worse for other honeybees because now there's more chance of spreading um, diseases or other pathogens. Now, if you, want, if you want to eat honey or if you want to sell honey, then you want honeybees but think of them more as livestock and not, not as a native species. So I mentioned those stem nesting bees and what some people do is they sell these bee bundles. So possibly little lengths of bamboo all together. Well, the problem with having so many together is that when a predator or a parasite finds one, it's found them all. 
And now we have the invasive Houdini fly that is taking over these nests and especially where they're all bundled together. So you can put out some bundles for our native bees, but just a couple um, tunnels together over one place, keep them separated, keep them far apart. Other habitat elements, brush piles. So this one is actually from my yard. I had to take down a couple of trees and the branches were piled on the side of the driveway. And I could see this big brush pile from my bedroom window. And I thought, well, I don't know if I wanna be looking out my window and see this brush pile, but actually, yes, there was so much activity on that brush pile. Carolina wrens, cat birds, Phoebe's would perch on it. The warblers when they were coming through, yellow rump warblers, black-throated blue warblers, blue-gray gnat catchers, they're all hiding out, hanging out in this brush pile in the wintertime. Those juncos and white-throated sparrows would hide out in there. So brush piles are a great habitat element as well as logs. So when those dead trees finally fall over, now you have a whole other community depending on this, um, these decomposing logs. And there's a great kid's book out called A Log's Life. So you might wanna check that one out. If it's in your pond, even if it's in your pond, logs make great habitat. So in our fisheries division, sometimes if there's, a not, if there's not enough, what they call coarse woody debris or large woody debris in the river, they might actually drop a tree in the river because this is a substrate for insects. That's food for fish. Fish can also hide out on that. I've seen birds perching. This is a tree that fell over at Belding. I've seen birds perching on it. Phoebe's using it to catch insects. We've seen turtles basking on it. So the, the thing to take home is that we need suitable places for all of our critters to exist. They have to have enough space. They have to not have enough space to find all of the food and water shelter that they need to survive and to what? to thrive, to survive, and to reproduce, exactly. So we need suitable places for all critters to exist. Now, sometimes what happens when we protect a piece of land, sometimes what we wanna do, we wanna go in there ourselves, and so we put trails in. All trails harm wildlife, so we need to find ways to do the least amount of harm if we wanna put trails in. But there have been studies that show when you put trails in, you lose some of your wildlife, especially birds. And there was one study in particular where a nature preserve that didn't have trails had a healthy population of wood turtles. Once they put in the trails, those wood turtles disappeared, all gone. So there are, um, there are ways that we can put trails in that can minimize the harm to wildlife. But think about this bird, the wood thrush. She spends the winter down in Central America and she has to find enough food and water and shelter to survive the winter. And then she has to really fuel up as she makes her way to the Gulf of Mexico. And she has to find a lot of fuel when she gets there because she's gonna fly off the, over the Gulf of Mexico just in one shot. When she lands, she has to find food and shelter, just to find food and shelter all the way back home. When she gets there, she has to replenish. She's going to be building her nest, laying her eggs, the eggs hatch, she has to spend all this energy finding food and feeding her young. And it just takes one dog one time. So of course the dog should always be on the leash, but if you have a trail in a sensitive area, then even if you have leash, you know, um, leash rules, leash policy, if someone doesn't obey it, it would just take one dog one time. So of course the way we can fix that is keeping the dogs on the leash, but also being very conscientious about how we put trails into our natural area. Do I still have time? Oh, all right, 10 minutes, including questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll get into this aspect. So we talked about native plants. So what some breeders do is they breed certain characteristics into the native plants. So for example, here's one of them. So breeders decided to turn this purple New England aster into a pink New England aster. And the way to tell if something is a cultivar or what we refer to as a nativar, so a cultivar of a native plant, it has this um, name in quotation marks. That's telling you that this is some type of, of cultivar. So does that make a difference? It's not the wild type, 
Well, for some, it does make a difference. So Annie White up in Vermont has been studying these cultivars and she had a patch of the wild New England aster and she had bees all over that patch and she was filming and you could see all the bees swarming all over there. And then she turned to the cultivar and there was just one or two bees on that whole patch. It wasn't providing food for the bees. It wasn't providing enough food for the bees. And another thing that happens in our cultivars is they change the color of the leaves. So this is a popular cultivar. This is nine bark. Nine bark's a native species, but this red leaf variety, we don't have any native wild plants that retain red leaves all year. So in Doug Tallamy's work, he's found that when they change the color of the leaves, it's no good for caterpillars. They won't feed on it. And imagine a lot of our caterpillars are green, you know, perfectly camouflaged for hanging out on green leaves. How's it going to hide on red leaves? Well, not only is it now not adapted to this new color, but it also can't feed on it. So not good for some. So some of our cultivars we know are not good for pollinators. Some we know are good for pollinators. A lot of them we just don't know. Some of our cultivator, cultivars we know are not good for caterpillars. And a lot of them we just don't know. So another thing to think about when you're managing habitat for wildlife, especially for pollinators, you want nectar sources throughout the year. Spring, like columbine. Early summer, like blackberries. Blackberries, a really good pollinator plant. Later in the summer, this is called butterfly milkweed. Since it's a milkweed, it's one of the host plants for the monarch caterpillar. And also the bees love it, lots of nectar in there for them. And then late summer, so Joe Pieweed. So those adult monarch butterflies, the caterpillars can only feed on the milkweed plant, but the adult butterflies have to find nectar throughout the season. And then of course, late into the fall, goldenrod for a whole bunch of pollinators and wild asters. So monarch butterflies depend on the goldenrod as well as many of our wild aster species. And so since we're talking about climate change this year, some people have been doing what they call assisted migration. So finding plants that do well in the south. And since our climate is going to be changing, they think that maybe this is a good idea to bring these plants up. It's actually not a good idea. The best thing for our habitat to adapt to a changing climate is to have an abundance of native wild type plants. So the more native plants we have, the better they'll be able to adapt to the changing climate. So no plants should be brought up in place of native plants without a whole bunch of research. We could be bringing in plants that are invasive up here. So black locust, it's invasive up here. It's a Southern species. We have a couple of species like that. Um, Southern pine beetle is now up here. It's invasive up here. So we have to be very careful. The best thing is to provide an abundance of native wild type plants for our habitats, for our ecosystems to adapt to the changing climate. So um, you might be interested in this. When you're out there, how do you know what everything is? Does everybody have this app? Okay, this is a great app. So this was developed by iNaturalist. And I think Pete had mentioned I iNaturalist this morning. You can post your observations to the iNaturalist website. This app, you load it onto your phone. You don't even have to take the picture, just hold it up to the plant or the insect or the amphibian or the reptile, and it will tell you what it is. If you take the picture, it will log it into your observations. And if you take the picture, you can also post it to iNaturalist. So record your observations. So this is a great, I highly recommend you'll be going out in your yard, identifying everything out there. Uh, so speaking of your yard, there are things that you can do in your yard for a bird-friendly life. The ABC, the American Bird Conservancy, has a bunch of different um, things that you can do to help birds in your yard. Like keeping cats indoors. So this was another thing that was in the news. Domestic cats kill over a billion birds in the United States every year. So birds are getting hit hard by loss of habitat. And then with that habitat loss, in come the birds. And then the birds are eating what's trying to survive there. So we can keep our cats inside. Just a perch at every window and they'll be perfectly happy. Okay, so again, the thing to remember, we need suitable places for all critters to exist. 
So does anybody have any questions about wildlife in general, habitat, anything that you've seen or noticed? Where is this type of wildlife? It's in Vernon. Yeah, so um, interesting place. So, and I don't know why that color didn't come up. Oh, so it's in Vernon. And so Vernon is a very highly developed town, high density. But the Belding Wildlife Management Area is a, within a separate watershed than all of that other development. And so because of that, the Tankerhusen River still has wild brook trout in it and some other pollution intolerant species. So you know, trying to protect as much of that watershed as possible because the more development in a watershed, the fewer species you have in the watershed. But we do have a website. And if you go to the website, you can learn about the habitat history. So a couple of slideshows, some of the things that we talked about here, um, habitat history and native landscaping, why native plants are so important. And species of the week. So every week we post a different species that you can find a, at Belding. So some quotes from Doug Talmy, every person on the planet needs a healthy ecosystem. If you don't have animals, you don't have a healthy ecosystem. And we need healthy ecosystems everywhere, not just in parks and preserves. So even in your yards, you can help wildlife, growing native plants, providing cover, giving animals their space. So does anyone have um, native plants in their yard? Mm -hmm. Nice. What do you see in your yard? I, I used to see, so I found that I had golden rye. Nice. Um, that's the only thing that comes to mind right now. Okay. Do you ever see the monarch butterflies coming through? No, I don't. Okay. I've, I've seen, seen them. them more being pollinated. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about like mountain laurel? Our state it is. It's our state flower. Okay, nice. Yeah, so that's typically an understory plant in the forest. Yeah. Bit of a disconnect between the native landscaping and what we're marketed to. Yes. And one reason for that is so the reason that the nurseries love to sell invasive plants is because they're easy to propagate. They're invasive and they do very well. They're easy to propagate. So you can make a lot of them. So some invasive plants have been banned, but some, um, the legislature was not able to ban things like burning bush, um, miscanthus grass is still for sale. You know, the, that big that big mound of ornamental grass in everybody's lawn, that's invasive. That's invading some of our grasslands now. Um, the grass that's like this? Yes. Oh, I'm going to have to, I was like, I'm thinking about the football field and the way to the football oh, field. Oh, no. Seek. I could use my seek and see what that is. Yeah. Now, we do have some native alternatives. So instead of miscanthus grass, it has a few names like Chinese grass, um, Chinese silver grass, silver grass, zebra grass, because there's different varieties of it. Um, you can plant instead, if it's a dry area, switchgrass. Is a nice clump forming grass that has the arching leaves and these beautiful, actually, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to get to everything, but I do have, oh, if you have bone set, look at that beauty. I bet everybody wants one of those in their yard, right? Oh, and here's the um, late summer plants, Joe Pieweed, bone set and goldenrod. They look beautiful together. Um, Go botany. If you've gone onto that website, Go Botany will tell you if the plant is native to the area or non-native to the area, if it grows at all in Connecticut. If you're looking for seeds to grow native plants, Eco 59 has locally sourced wild type seeds to get you started. Um, some nice resources. Oh, I should have made them. Yeah. So that's the miscanthus grass. That's the invasive non-native one. You can replace it with fringed sedge. This likes it moist or switchgrass. So switchgrass has these, those really feathery influence. You might see it all, along the high, the side of the highway. Looks all fluffy and feathery. But it's since it's native, it's also a host plant for some of our rare um, butterfly and moth species, the caterpillars. We're gonna wrap up. Okay, we're done now. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody.
and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.